for another engaging, exciting discussion. And you know, since the time I was allocated this topic, I've been wondering, why me? Because it's a very controversial, provocative, but I think something that we must put on the table fairly and squarely. Uh, so before I start, let me introduce my esteemed panel members. So you have uh, Anisha Amotwani. I've known Anisha for many, many, many years. A very renowned marketeer. She's also been on the uh, business today's 50 most powerful women in India for consecutively three years. Associated with brands like Nestle Polo, Nestle Maggie, Dabur Hair Oils. Also an author of a book called Storm the Norm. Anisha, thank you very much. And she's going to represent the patient you know, on this panel. Dr. Narottam Puri, we have seen him in many, many avatars, you know, from a clinician to a CEO to an encyclopedia of sports to an integral part of, you know, FIPI as well. Dr. Puri, thank you very much, you know, for being with us. Dr. Y.P. Bhatia, uh, who's been at the forefront of hospital and healthcare facility management since 1981. He's played a large role. He was the chairman for NABH, you know, as well and associated with planning for many, many hospitals like Rajiv Gandhi, Cancer Institute, Med City, Medanta, etc. Bhavdeep uh, has a very, very rich background in retail and healthcare, uh, mostly in the US. He's currently the CEO of Fortis uh, and is really, you know, very, very strong tra track record of building and leading great teams while delivering exceptional results. And then our friend from Bombay, Gautam, who manages the Hinduja Hospital. He's seen both sides. He was earlier with 3M and now with Hinduja. So, Gautam, thank you very much for coming all the way. And Dr. Bhartia, especially thanks to you. I know you're not well, so thank you for being here. So, ethics in healthcare, a very wide-ranging topic. It straddles clinical matters, moral dilemmas, commercial aspects, policy-related issues. So it's a very, very, you know, diverse topic. And what makes it more complicated is the fact that healthcare is a very fragmented industry. From a quack operating in a village to a small nursing home to charitable hospitals to government hospitals to large private you know, providers. Therefore, all the practices that people indulge in tend to cast you know, a shadow over the entire sector. And that's quite difficult. I think in the previous session, we talked a lot about the trust deficit. And I think what lies at the core of that question, perhaps, is two things. One, the mindset in India seems to be that healthcare should be free as people approach hospital. That's the mindset. And second, perhaps, is this entire issue of ethics that we'll discuss. So what we'll do, I'll just set up the entire you know, discussion, just tee it up, then ask a question to each panel member and ask them to make some opening comments, and then come back for a second round summarize and leave enough time. I'm sure all of you will have many, many questions. Leave about 15, 20 minutes for questions as well. So let me give you, you know, a few examples of what are real life challenges that providers face, you know, on the floor in the hospital every day. And there are a wide range from the question of end of life support. There is no legal framework in India today which allows a clinician to take a call. Intertwined with that are family issues in India. So how do you make a call on that? Declaration of brain dead. On the one hand, you have a very abysmal low rate of donations, right? And yet there is a question of family counseling and there's a need, so how do you handle that? Sometimes we find in emergency, people don't give consent for angiography because the perception is the moment you go for an angio, you will surely get a stent or two. And we struggle with this issue of the 60 minutes which is so critical from door to balloon time, but yet we don't find attendants giving consent. Patient needing treatment, but run out of funds. So what should a provider do? Perception of less time being spent by doctors versus long wait time to meet them. So which way should we go? Perception of over-testing, but in case a clinician misses a diagnosis, there's a blame game which, which, which begins. Unfortunately, violence, if the clinical outcomes are not as per expected, you know, uh, unexpected lines. Somebody was comparing the CSEC rates, you know, in government hospitals saying they're so low, 0.5 to 1%. Why is private sector 35, 40, 50%? Well, nobody then states the fact that in government hospitals, there's no gynecologist, nobody to give anesthesia, and obviously mortality suffers, right? So when you look at statistics, look at the entire picture. On the other hand, from a patient perspective, lack of transparency, inadequate communication, 
huge deviation between actual bill and estimates given in the front and, and adverse incentives. And some hospitals, by the way, do hold patients to ransom. I'm aware of a case where a small child went with uh, for a kidney transplant but had typhoid. And the hospital took a deposit and said, cure the typhoid, then come back to us. Almost like a captive customer. So all the shades exist. Now, unfortunately, this entire area is full of gray. There's no black and white. And perhaps that's what makes it most difficult when we converse, but converse we will. We will put all the issues you know, on the table, and I want to state two life cases to illustrate the difficulty in, in trying to take a stance. So there's a long-staying patient in one hospital, staying there for one and a half years. Not fit to discharge, but not sick as well. Family refusing to take the patient back home, and the government body covering the expenses refusing to pay. Whose accountability is this? There is no legal framework which allows the hospital to take the patient out. So what should the provider do? Case number two, a young girl needing kidney transplant from a very, very poor family, father self-employed, you know, worker, comes to a hospital. The clinician knows the life can be saved, is willing to do the transplant for free. Yet the father is worried that after the transplant, who will take care of the child and is willing to let the child go so that he can focus on the other two siblings. Now, is the provider supposed to play a role of counseling, clinical treatment, and funding? Should the provider straddle all roles? These are real life issues that we face. As I said, no easy answers but we'll put all the issues on the table for a good discussion. So let me start. And my first question is to, to Anisha, actually, as I said, that she's a patient protagonist you know, on this panel. So Anisha, here's the, the first question for you. So unfortunately, in India every year, about 10 to 12 percent of families do get pushed into poverty yeah. you know, because of a medical emergency or an event that happened in their house. They're not able to fund it. Uh, yet, on the other hand, the government has, is spending for the last few years 1.52% of GDP, and that needle hasn't moved either. So whose responsibility is this to make sure? Or what can the private sector do? Or is it really the private sector's responsibility? I mean, how do you view this subject? So, Rajat, uh, I think that's, uh, that is the real dilemma, you know, as far as healthcare in this country is concerned. Uh, on one side, you know, you have the largest number of medical colleges anywhere in the world. We've got 400 plus medical colleges. No country in the world has that many medical colleges. Mm -hmm. But yet the number of students coming out are only 50,000 per year, approximately those kind of numbers, medical graduates coming out. And almost one third of them want to go abroad for their masters. Okay, So there is a lot of... One, there is, when we look at the size of our population, despite having large number of medical colleges, we aren't creating enough supply, okay? Uh, access to medical itself, which is a basic right, becomes a challenge. So how do we make, first at a fundamental root cause level, how do we change the medical education system in India? I think for me, that is a role that government can play so that the supply issue gets addressed. Okay, one is to stop migration at a master's level, retain the talent in India. And the second thing is, how do we make sure that, you know, only 20% or less, 15% is the pass rate out of the number of people who want to sit in. Today, the options are so many to students that they do not even want to sit in for medical exams. But of those who sit in, there is only a 15% pass rate. So that's another thing that we need to see, you know, how do we change the curriculum so that you get a better supply. The minute the supply is there and the supply demand ratio becomes equal, you know, this balance will start coming in. And I think the second thing that is happening here is the transparency that is supposed to be, you know, in many other sectors, financial sector, say, for example, there's a lot of transparency. The data is visible. There is a stock market of financial exchange, okay, where every company publishes their data. There is a Carvey and a CAMS equivalent, okay, in financial services where no matter where you buy your product from, there is an aggregator that makes information available. When it comes to healthcare, 
I think there is no transparent way in which outcome data from various providers, whether individual or organizations, is available at a single point anywhere. And that's leading to a lot, lot of mistrust. If I have to find out information about a particular doctor, a particular hospital, there is no scientific facts. So there is a lot of perception. And that perception is actually, and we all know perception is bigger than reality. I, I was told that in the previous session there was so much discussion around uh, perception and you know how media can play a role. Now that perception is fueled by anecdotal cases. Okay, by far I would like to believe that if facts and data are available, if there is a Carvi or the of of healthcare or the CAMS equivalent, or if there's a stock exchange of healthcare where outcome data is published and this transparency of facts. There is a, and, and government can do that. If not today, when? Because digitization allows you to do that. There's a lot of trust that will start coming back into the system. All right, thank you. Dr. Puri, you have seen the healthcare sector from various perspectives. I'm sure as part of FIKI, interact with various government officials as well. So, you know, on the one hand, India is the lowest cost quality healthcare provider across the world, even compared to Thailand for some procedures. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of people flocking into India you know, for medical treatment. Yet, you find that to a lot of our fellow countrymen, good quality healthcare is not accessible. So whose role is it, you know, to cater to the masses? Is it the private sector? And therefore, we get viewed in that light. Is it the government? How should we look at this issue? Well, first of all, uh, thank you, Rajit, for inviting me to this panel. This must be the only incidence when a 12th man actually gets to bat. <laughs> Uh, I was not supposed to be on the, on the panel and uh, uh, Samir Parik just recently re reminded us that we need to be humane. So that reminds me of a story. Allow me to delve into that. Sure. You have heard of Lala Amarnath and Ajit Wadekar in Indian cricket. Once we were doing a commentary together and Ajit Wadekar was supposed to join us uh, for that commentary session. He didn't arrive. It was in Kanpur. So Lala Manath, who was covering for a Nagpur-based newspaper, was asked to step in. So he did step in. On the fifth day, as the match was about to end, checks had, were distributed to the commentators. So Lala Manath also received his check. After that, the game went on for about an hour. But Lala Manath, despite being asked, those days we used to ask the expert for an opinion, kept asking, uh, Lala ji, what is your opinion? He refused to answer. So when I nudged him and said that uh, a colleague of mine is asking you this question, he says, I'm not going to answer, I've been paid. <laughs> so my, I haven't been paid, I'm the 12th man who's batting, uh, so pardon me for the excesses, if any. But this is, uh, Rajit, you're absolutely right, this is, uh, uh, this is like almost, uh, as Dr. Jairam would say, entering into the abdomen. You never know what you're going to find. So once uh, an incision has been made, uh, my, my two-bit take on this is, I don't think, we, we have a tendency in India to say that anything that is not mine is the government's job. So if I take the kula out from my house and put it into the street, it's the government's job to clean it. I don't think this cost quality conundrum is ever going to be sorted out by any one person, one organization, or one country at all. I think uh, over a period of time, a balance will emerge. Uh, healthcare is, as you said, a very complex situation, and it's not going to be easy to find answers, particularly in a country that requires so much of it. But uh, there is no doubt, like Anisha also pointed out, that at the end of the day, what the patient really is expecting is a good outcome. And he wants that outcome not only of the procedure that may be done, but also that no complications ensue after that. I think to that extent, the quality part becomes the paramount thing. And when that quality is compromised for one reason or the other, that creates a trust deficit and questions of ethicality of conduct then automatically arise. We believe that it's the government's job to uh, accredit hospital. Somebody suggested that in the morning, why doesn't the government make it compulsory? Except in two or probably three countries, accreditation is a voluntary process. 
it's not compulsory or mandatory at all. And I believe that that's how it should be. Because if you are quality con conscious, it will come out yourself. Quality is a bit like beauty. It lies in the eyes of the beholden. Similarly, quality also has several determinants to it. So I think, to, in, in a nutshell, the answer is that I don't think it's only the government's role to provide this cost quality issue. But at the same time, the government definitely owes it to the public to make sure that a minimum standard of quality is made available. Now, one way of doing that is like a quality tool, like accreditation, but it's not the only way. The second is the publishing, publishing in public domain of outcome results, but I don't think that we've reached the maturity. Just beginnings have been made in a couple of instances, but I would like to just point out that even the publishing of such a data carries with it an inherent risk. Take the example of New York State and United States. When they started publishing their data for coronary artery surgery, the number of difficult cases that were refused far outnumbered the number of cases that used to get done earlier. So the surgeon said that if I'm going to be measured on this, I'm not going to do a four-vessel bypass in a diabetic who's uncontrolled, go to Connecticut or to New Jersey and get it done. Because I don't want my results to be compromised. So only the good cases were done. So there, there are many ifs and buts for it, but definitely it's a, a, a trust-boosting uh, phenomenon if the outcome results were published and they were uh, openly available to it. You said something, uh, sec secondary no, part? No, that's, that's it. Thank so you. thank you, Ajit. You know, so you are for a collaborative framework between government and private, as you're saying. And I quite agree that you know everything in healthcare has many dimensions to it, as you were rightly saying. So while publishing outcomes is a good thing to do, one must watch out for the unintended you know, consequences. So thank you for that. Dr. Bhatia, shifting now to the clinical domain, which is where most issues of you know ethics and building an ethical organization lie. And we have heard of many cases, as I said, of euthanasia, organ donation, brain death, reuse of single-use devices, etc. So given your, your, your background in ABH, what principles and guidelines should we follow which uphold good practices? Is there a code of conduct apart from NABH that hospitals can adopt so that the, the customers or patients get, get confidence? What should we do? Uh, Rajat, I think, uh, you know, right since the morning and now we are talking of trust deficit and trust deficit, transparency, I think the question which uh, every patient or the family is confronted with, that what should have been done for me, is that being done for me? Many of the times I think all of us who are in the healthcare domain, we get questions from our friends or families or otherwise, that is this what should be done for us? One of the factor which I feel that we haven't been able to create any standards for what clinical processes or what protocols we should follow. Whether we talk of NABH, JCI, or any of the standard, they say that you, know, you should have the common protocol or you should have some decided protocols. Unfortunately, we don't have such guidelines, whether at the national level. Mm -hmm. Very seriously, it's available at the, some of the institutions. Some of the organizations where we have been associated, we have been trying to do it, people have done it. But then compliance of that is so minuscule that you cannot say that this is how it is. Like in US, we have NCCN guidelines for the cancer treatment. At least there is something to look forward when a hospital says that I am giving chemotherapy and the chemotherapy is in line with so and so guidelines. Similarly, for at least the commonest thing which are being done by all the hospitals, like CABG processes, when, it, when to go for CABG, when to go for a, you know, a stunt, what exactly it is, what to do in a triple vessel disease. Now, at least the commonest things which are happening, can we create guidelines? Mm. End stage disease, when to call it an end stage disease? Can we have a national guideline and national guideline adopted and complied by all the people? So I think where we are right now is one,
that let's create some standard that when a patient says or patient's family says what to expect we have some documented thing that this is what we do for every patient who come with this so you are for some kind of standardization given the fragmented nature of the sector absolutely and if that can be adopted at the national level i think it will be one of the best things to happen to the industry because people then will tend not to blame you at least you can say that i did what the guidelines said to that got it got it thank you thank you for that so bhagdi in the previous session we heard the overhang you know when omkar asked the question how many people think there is over testing and majority of the people put up their hands so given this overhang of public sentiment that the private you know hospitals are profiteering right is this time for us to start thinking about and restructuring clinician compensation models perhaps um <clears throat> you know dr puri um took um took a couple of seconds to share a story and i'd like to share a story with you as well because i think that um part of the conversation we're having is as much about what's happening in the industry as it is about the culture in india and what we do in india so this morning um <clears throat> my driver was late coming and um so i called my driver and asked him i said um abhi tak aaye nahi aap and he says 5 minute mein pahunch raha hu hang up the phone 5 minute 7 minute 10 minute I called again. I said, "Mukesh, abhi tak aaye nahi aap? Sir, abhi kone mein hu? Ek minute mein aa raha hu." Eventually, short of 35 minutes after my first call. And <clears throat> the reality is that that's how we do things in many, many places, right? Whether it's whether it's our driver, whether it's our family members, that's a way of life for us in India. Somebody asks us something, our first instinct is. to tell people what they want to hear or something other than what is avoidance that's just culturally it's one of the challenges we have in india so if you think about the industry <clears throat> our industry rather to your point is probably the most maligned industry in india today I mean, it's a tough time to be in healthcare right if you're a hospital operator whether it's um, whether it's what you hear at night on the news shows whether it's what you hear on on um, on any talk show whether you pick up the newspaper so i think the questions actually a bit broader i agree that i think there's a conversation and a dialogue uh, that needs to take place in the industry but how do we change the way we're being perceived i don't know i'm not ready to sign on 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 a notion that that we need to change the doctor compensation model i actually think that we need to fix it which might mean it may not necessarily mean the doctors make less they may very well make more by the way but it's a function of being able to align the work that a clinician does with the outcome piece that we talked about a few minutes ago being able to align that but i think it's bigger than that i actually think that the entire um, discussion we're having around having an ethical healthcare system you start to hear the word transparency a lot in india today you start to hear about having an honest conversation an actual discussion about what's working what's not working so i think that we need to step back a little bit I think we need to have a conversation with our doctors because we don't necessarily do that. But I think similarly, we need to have a conversation with our patients. I think we need to have a more honest discussion. Um, we all have, all of us, unfortunately, have incidents that have happened to us or our family members about about the frustration of not knowing what's going on. So I think opening up, removing that parda, having a more honest discussion, having a better conversation, and I certainly think that the doctor relationship overall needs to be looked at. whether compensation is a piece of it or not i think that will be a function of what that discussion looks like thank you so you are for as anisha was saying transparency we are talking about stepping back and communicating with the patient clinicians and reexamining the patient clinician relationship right and you said about com let's let's fix it right so thank you gautam over to you as i said this topic has many dimensions i want to offer you a very provocative and interesting dimension so these days we see a you know a lot of people from media houses some corporates coming forward and doing some kind of ranking exercises the rank hospitals or rank doctors right and uh, we get calls you know saying that there is a sponsorship available you know this ranking can be done this way or that way uh, and this obviously tends to influence patients because what they see published in the media as rank is what will influence them 
Now, what can we do as healthcare providers to counter this emerging menace? Rajit, this is uh, provocative, and if there are some mm -hmm. media people in the house, then it's really provocative. So, let, let me examine it from two perspectives. One, from the media perspective, three actually, media, patient, and the hospital's uh, concern. Mm -hmm. So, I understand why the media or the other corporate houses do it, because it's, it's a way of getting equivalent to readership, TRP, and you know, something new they have done. And it's a way of generating resources. So th that is their uh, view on, that is their rational as far as I understand. It's a capitalist world. They take money, they spend money, that's how they do. Now, for a patient, why, for lack of, like Dr. Puri said and Bhavdeep said and you mentioned, for lack of any other known sources of ranking or knowing that hospital A is better than hospital B, I tend to rely either on word of mouth, my friend, or whatever I read in the media, which, to be honest, media, sometimes when they publish it, they write it is an editorial. But nobody reads that it is an editorial. We read it because we know. But otherwise, people don't read it. So now think of it from a hospital perspective. From a hospital perspective, and I'm linking it back to the previous session and what you just mentioned, we want, all of us as patients, we want it to be free. I want the best quality, but I want it free. You're going to charge me, so now I'm, you know, I'm hurt that you're charging me. So now, from a hospital perspective, they need to provide the good quality at minimum prices. They need to ensure, you know, all the systems, processes, and like you said, there are many unorganized players, and majority are unorganized. So if you want to have an organized, you have system processes, you need to have people, you need, you need to invest in things. You need money. So if you need money, today reality is the source of money is only the patients or charity depending on what your model is. So if you want patients to come, there has to be a way of patients to know. So that is why this loop is going on. And I think the way to break this, in I don't know whether it will work or not, one of course is a self-regulation. That if the hospitals who are, who are given this call and who at the top say, Sorry, I know, but I am not going to participate in it. If you want money for this ranking, I am not part of it. So, after a while, I think it will get established that people who, uh, they do not pay money to get themselves ranked. So, that is one thing. Second thing is, if there is more interaction, like Bhavdeep said, Parda Hatao, if there is more interaction with the patient groups, there are, you know, forums where it is discussed that what is the right quality. It is not... Uh, aspect A which determines the quality but clinical outcome or whatever is the aspect. I think that transparency, that dialogue will uh, move ahead. I, I know it's not the solution but that's my thought on that. Thank you. So Anisha, back to you. And as I said, the, the subject is very emotive and I'm sure you have been a caregiver, you know, or at, at some point of time in your life as well. So from a patient's perspective, what tangible, visible actions should the private sector providers take to bridge this trust or this gap? So, you know, I'm also a, I'm also a brand person who's built several brands. And when I look at it first with the lens of, of somebody who's created, you know, and helped build industries and brands, I think the fastest deterioration has happened in this industry. From this whole very few decades back, we used to say, Dr. Bhagwan hai, you know, to today, Dr. Chor hai, okay? Fastest deterioration in perception I have seen in this industry. And as a brand person, I can tell you that perception is bigger than reality. And also, what can fix it is far, far more softer aspects than experiential aspects. And we, we do a lot of work, and Rajat, you were also party to it, when we, ha when we did this whole work on insurance, agents chore hain, mm. and we came up with this thing. And when we diagnose some of this, we realize that in any kind of industry, 60% is perceptual, image-related matters, and 40% is factual matters, experiential things, okay? So the, we need to work on both, but communication, perception, imagery is easy to work upon. And I think the industry needs to help itself. Media needs to play a big role, but industry needs to help itself. 
I would want to believe that for every one wrong case, there are at least 90% right cases or 99% right cases that are happening. I have my mother-in-law who is a gynecologist who is practicing till she's, she's 90. She's been in Gangadam and many of you would know her. When her patient is ill or is going into a difficult labor, she wakes up at 3 o'clock in the morning to read Hanuman Chalisa for the patient. I would like to believe that most doctors, I mean that's an extreme case, but many doctors do feel for their patients. But what, what is getting visibilized today, the perception that's getting created is the exceptional few cases. So how do we, we as an industry work on an image makeover for healthcare? I think that's very important. While lots of action, and I'm sure you people are technical experts and you will do things on the experiential side, on the experiential side, of course, technology will play a big role in getting efficiencies and knocking off costs. I don't know if you read in today's economic times, Senos is, is bought over by Google, a company which is using mobile phones as medical devices. You can check your hemoglobin and you can check your you know, various parameters just using your mobile phones. Uh, it's, it's an Indian Patel, you know, and Google has bought this over uh, currently. So technology will bring in process efficiencies at, at, a, at one level. But I think what we need to work on is, and I think uh, Bhavdeep also talked about, communication, softer aspects of creating the right perception for the industry. Because it is a caregiving industry. Finally, when it comes, you are leaving your life in the hands of a doctor. If we don't bring that faith back in the doctor, almost Bhagwan jesa faith, ki you know, is doctor ne dekha hai, to thiki hoga. You know, we we need to single-mindedly work on that. For me, I think that's the biggest to-do task as far as I'm concerned. You know. Thank you. Thank you for bringing in that perspective from from marketing standpoint. So back to Dr. Puri. Uh, so imagine for for the next five minutes, you are secretary, health and family welfare. Right? <laughs> And you, you have heard all the woes that we have as private sector providers. And you talked about a collaborative framework. What do you think are the first few steps you would recommend the private providers take to build collaboration and, and bridge this trust deficit? Uh, Rajit, if you per permit me, uh, there's something that I want to respond to what Anisha sure, said. Sure, sure, sir. Sure. Uh, Anisha referred to her mother-in-law, and she happens to be my teacher in MBBS in the years 66, 67, 68 probably. <laughs> and uh, what she mentioned about her is absolutely true. I can vouch for it. She's still in Gangaram. And the lessons that she taught me, and this is something I'm for the first time articulating uh, publicly, is uh, watching some of uh, the teachers. You imbibe certain traits like we do in, in, in Indian customs, we call them sanskars. Sanskars come from either your parents, your family, or from your teachers. All along, while, whilst I've been washing my hands, I've had one prayer on my lips. Mere haath se kuch galat na. I've never said that, let this be a success or this thing, but mere haath se galat na. Probably it was because of teachers like her. But uh, you're talking about an aspect of communication. Let me just say that whilst everyone uh, believes that communication is the key point whenever <coughs> there is a question of trust deficit, in fact, JCI survey has pointed out that 70% of medical errors and negligence is because of only one reason, and that's communication, communication errors. The sad part of it is that those of you who are medical students or have been medical students will know that this is one subject which is not taught in medical college at all. Whereas abroad, there is actually an exam that you have to pass in communication both in UK and USA. Communication is not taught. Quality is not taught. Basics of finance are not taught. And these are the three that you require to utilize in every aspect <coughs> of your medical life when you become doctors. Now, uh, to Rajit's question, if I were in C.K. Mishra's shoes, well, I'd shudder. I'll shudder to be in his shoes, particularly after Gorakhpur. And uh, it's a very tough job. It's a very tough ask for anybody. Healthcare is so complex that the world hasn't found a solution. 
Donald Trump is wanting to undo Barack, uh, Barack Obama's care. Uh, France is reeling under so much of uh, health care uh, deficit, being a socialist country that uh, they are losing something like 34,000 euros a day on health care. Germany has already moved into an insurance model. NHS is, has been reformed. So these are developed countries who spend something like 8 to 18 percent of their GDP in health care. Here is a country which promises to spend 2.5 percent of its GDP in the year 2025. At the present, it spends about 1 percent or 1.4 percent and uh, has a population base of 1.25 billion half of them are illiterate. So it's an onerous task, and I don't want to be in Sikha Mishra's shoes at all. But since you put me there, the one thing that I'd request uh, the government to do, my, the minister and my colleagues to do, is to just erase this line between public and private. Unless and until these two get narrowed and meet somewhere, I don't think solutions can be found only by one sector. The government is providing approximately 25% of healthcare in this country. 75% is by the private sector, organized and unorganized. How is the government likely to reach anywhere near the figure that we are proposing to reach? I think it can only happen through two or three means. One is a public-private partnership in which the government uh, should play the secondary role. They are loath to do that because they don't want to hand over control to private because they believe that we will profiteer. The second is an increase in insurance, social insurance and health insurance. Why should it not be compulsory, as Ashok Kakkar said in the morning? Uh, you know, it's, it's okay for you to, it's in, um, compulsory for you to insure your car or scooter, but not the driver who's driving. So I think insurance costs are going to lessen the burden. Over a period of time, I think you'll have to have a kind of a, a meeting of uh, the minds of both the public and the private people. Sadly, what used to happen in the past when missionary trusts and other uh, corporate bodies which were rich uh, used to invest a lot in healthcare. Today, hardly anybody does it. You are probably an exception, but uh, hardly anybody uh, does it anymore. Therefore, the answers will have to be found by the government and the industry sitting together. Regrettably, there is a huge trust deficit there, just as it, it is between patient and the doctor. So, you know, uh, something you were saying during our tea break, is that what is coming in the way of the private accepting the Clinical Establishment Act? Somebody asked that question. Your perspective on that? See, the, the point is, uh, there was a question that was uh, being put in the panel prior to this uh, by one of the panelists. He says, we don't understand why the private sector is loath to accept the Clinical Establishment Bill. It's a good thing. There should be regulation. I'm not denying that there should be regulation. Regulation is definitely needed when you have so many quacks practicing. But the point is that in the panel that the government has formed, it has forgotten that 75% of healthcare is by the private players. And in the panel that they have formed of the doctors who are going to control this clinical establishment bill, there is not a single private player. That means you have no trust that we are going to do the right thing. How is it that Till yesterday when I was teaching in the medical college, you trusted me. Today I am across the road, you don't trust me? Why is it that the Clinical Establishment Act does not have representation or adequate representation from the private sector when it provides the majority of it? Fiki Rishoba will remember when we sent our comments on the Clinical Establishment Bill, we all unanimously said that it's a good thing to do. But for God's sake, have, if not proportionate, at least adequate representation so that you don't have a license Raj kind of a situation. That's the point that I wanted to make. Thank you. <clears throat> so let's lighten up the mood a little bit and shift, shift to Gotham. So you know, uh, these days you receive many things on WhatsApp and one of the 
you know, Mr. Zahir Rasik, it was that when, when you go out and eat whatever you want in the market, whether it's Pani Puri or Pav Bhaji or Bombay Sandwich, uh, you never question, you know, what's the side effect. But the moment a doctor prescribes an antibiotic, the first question you have is, what's the side effect, right? Similarly, on costs, an average family in India would spend about five to 7,000 rupees on a dinner or entertainment or a movie. And yet, when they have to shell out a 1,200 or 800 rupees OPD fee, is a big question, right? So how do you think, Gautam, you know, what can we do to educate the consumers about the true cost of quality delivery? What should we do? Rajat, it's a mammoth task. And I can say that uh, many people in my family are also guilty of the same thing. Oh, the doctor costs so much. But, but I think it starts, it starts from a mindset that we don't think that healthcare is important for each of us. Means we, in I can say about India, I don't know about the rest of the world, is we don't think that human life is important, whether on the road somebody else's or mine. We just think it because Bhagwan hai, karam hai, ye hai, wo, sab, everything will be taken care of by God. But reality, God wants us to take care of ourselves. So that I think needs to be built in in the society through uh, public forums, public debates, through in schools, saying that healthcare is an important part. And the more you can focus on, for example, preventive, you can control your health because it is inevitable that people like friends of mine, I'm giving an example, they are very well educated and you said 5,000, they probably spent 10, 20,000 on a dinner. And you ask them, how much insurance do you have? He says, 3 lakhs. I said, 3 lakhs? In 20 years time, when you will probably go for a knee replacement or some other problem, bill will be 20 lakhs. And they don't understand it. So the, the, nobody has told them that healthcare is important and it's important to spend. So that discussion is important. And also, this discussion about what do you get? So uh, they think that I'm spending five minutes with a doctor. But what they are not understanding that the doctor has spent 25 years perfecting his, what he is going to say in that five minutes to you. So there is accumulated knowledge coming to you, wisdom coming to you. So there is a value in that, uh, you know, five minutes. And the other thing is, there is, you know, uh, what Dr. Uh, Nautampuri just mentioned about the priority of government for healthcare. I think when, this is my view, and I hope the government doesn't get me wrong, I don't think it is the, their priority. Because right now, if it is a priority, then you, you do what it is. You do the awareness campaigns about health prevention. You put the money where you have to. And you are right now, government says that healthcare is a priority, but I will let healthcare, uh, private guys do it at a lower cost. I am going to fix the cost. So it is not the healthcare which is a priority. It is the cost which is the economics which is a priority. So there is a little misplaced thing. So that, and I am going to just Take one minute, 30 seconds more. Talk about Anisha. She mentioned, I really like that perspective, when you mentioned that the fastest deterioration in the brand value of the doctors. So I don't know how that faith can be restored. But I think if there is a way of sharing 99% successful rate, and I can tell you I've met many, many doctors, and many work with us, they are really uh, you know, committed to the cause of the patient. They, I don't know whether they read Hanuman Chalisa or not, but they are committed, they are worried, they know, and, and you know, and that doesn't come out at, at all. So, I don't know what we can do, but somehow if these things can be brought out, paying 1,000 rupees or 800 or 1,500, I think patients will pay. And they should allocate a budget, 5,000 rupees a month on preventive care, and I think that will be fine. So, can I just comment on that? Sure, right, sure. Probably. You know, I think that um, one, one of the interesting things that I find is that very often, and um, you know, I'm no different. I think it goes for all of us. Is that we um, we have um, you know what what we used to call in the U.S. a, a deer in the headlights kind of look. Like mm -hmm. you know, how did this happen to us? And the reality is that <clears throat> we're in this position because either by default or otherwise, because we let it happen. Hmm. Right? We let it happen. And um, I've been in and out of healthcare for the last six, seven years. And um, and I've told people very often that um, I went back to the U.S. for four years, came back, and somebody asked me about healthcare and you know what had happened, what had changed, etc. And I told them I felt like I'd been watching a Hindi movie, stepped out for half an hour, came back, and didn't really miss much, because we haven't evolved. 
Yeah, and I think that uh, when the going was good, you know, when the going was good, whether it was the surveys that we talked about earlier, the truth is that we all rejoiced when we were ranked in the, in the top rankings. We all rejoiced. Very often we knew that there was no substance behind it. But, you know, aage gaya, chhap gaya, khush te. We were all very happy. I think so there's the doctor relationship piece of it. Um, the reality is that the industry as a whole, we haven't done a very good job <coughs> in moving with everything else that's happening around us. So you talked about outcomes earlier, right? Having clinical outcomes, whether it's having data, data points, yep. having transparency, right? We take a great deal of pride today that we can tell a patient or an attendant that this is what's happening in the OT. The patient's been there for two hours. We do a check, come back and tell the patient what's going on. So we take a lot of pride that we're doing that. The reality is we should have been doing this a while back. So I think that it's no surprise we are where we are. I think the real question becomes is where do we go from here? And what does it look like a year from now? Because if a year from now, Rajat, if we're all sitting here having the same conversation, so then um, it'll be shame on us all, all over again. No, no, I appreciate that candor. And that gives me a perfect segue in, uh, in my next question to you, Baudi. Uh, you're right. The industry has done many things to itself. So we, we hear about a variety of business sourcing practices, whether it's the you know providers or, or diagnostic companies or pharma companies. We, we hear about it. And there's no point trying to deny it. They must be existing. Right, in some shape or form. Uh, so there's been a furious debate over this, that sh is it unethical or should it be illegal? So has the time come for us to, to advocate and canvas for a much more aggressive, intrusive legislative framework which puts a check on these practices? You know, I think that, um, <clears throat> I think as an industry, we're a bit of a crossroad right now. Right? Um, you just heard me say a few minutes ago, we're probably the most maligned industry in the country today. The reality is that, um, that we probably still have a bit of a window here. We still, still have a bit of an opportunity to, uh, you know, we've had multiple conversations at forums like this about self-regulation, right, about imposing our own parameters in terms of what's good, what's not, what's acceptable, what's not. I think that um, eventually, in, in any organized, mature environment, uh, whether it's industry, whether it's uh, socioeconomic environment, whatever it might be, that typically, a government regulation or government framework merely comes and formalizes what the experts have deemed to be the appropriate parameters to operate in. In our case, we haven't done that yet. So what's happening is that if you look at what's been happening with some of the pricing issues, <coughs> stent pricing, right? We just had the ortho, ortho implants news that came out yesterday. Uh, the whole reusability issue it's, uh, that's coming out. And then you know, I think that one of the things that happens, we are the experts. Right? I'm not a doctor, but we are the experts. The healthcare operators are the experts. In a perfect world, what would happen is that we would have our own framework that we formalize, and government legislation merely comes and sits on top of it, merely validating and confirming that what you're doing is right. I think what's happening instead in our case is that we haven't done that piece. So government is coming on top and saying, Aaj se aap log ye karoge. Right? you're going to do it this way and we don't have a proper say in it. So I think that um, the answer to the question is, no, I don't think that's the right way to go. I think the worst thing that could happen is that, um, that while we're all sitting in this room, that um, somewhere else in some other room, somebody's deciding for us under what parameters we operate under, what pricing structure we operate under, what guidelines we operate under. I think that's the worst thing that could happen. Um, the right, hopefully the way we can go forward is that we establish it, we formalize it, and the government merely comes along and says, based on best practices in the industry, this is what everybody should do going forward. Got it, got it. My last question before I throw it open to the audience and then I will summarize to, to Dr. Bhatia. So all of us have talked about some shape or form of either publishing clinical outcomes or self-regulation. So would you recommend that we really set up a clinical quality regulator in India, much like what you have in the NHS, which does you know, uh, inspection, orders, lays down procedures, <coughs> and therefore publish an index so the patients can really look at each provider and say, what's the index? I mean, has the time come for that? Would you recommend? If yes, what should be its shape, form, scope, etc.? I would go with what uh, Bhavdeep said just now. If you ask for answer whether we need it, yes. But is it needed like a regulator? I think the present situation is the whole industry is bound by one regulation or the other or the other practically on the day-to-day -day basis. Every day, every week, you are actually in for a surprise with a new regulation. The interpretation of that regulation, the understanding of that regulation is 
absolutely dismal, creating into more confusion, more complexity than what they are. So I think what is rightly required is that let's start working towards it in a self-regulated environment. Let the industry, let the association of physicians, let the other associations come together and start creating some basic framework around it. And that basic framework later on probably becomes a situation when the regulator may come in, self-regulatory or otherwise. It's a typical case like NABH. In 2001, 2002, when we started moving around for medical tourism and suddenly realized that accreditation is the need of the hour. 2002, the task force was constituted by the industry itself. Shabnam and others would remember. That's how we all started. 2002 to 2005, we worked purely on what could be done and what should be done. And it was in July 2005 when we had some substantive material, about 1,000 pages of documents which we had worked around. We handed over to Mr. Gyani in QCI to start working on, which ultimately became NABH after one year in 2006. So maybe that stage when we should have a regulator is little far, but the stage is definitely ripe to start working towards that and create a framework which could ultimately, and I think what Dr. Narottam Puri has been very rightly saying, let's do something ourselves before it comes from the government. This is how you'll have to do. So if we start working towards it now and come prepared and be prepared, I think that will be the best thing to do. And we already have a precedence in the form of how NABH came into being. Right. So it's possible to do. Yes. Yeah, thank you. I'm just opening it to the audience. Hold on, I can, I can, I can see here. <laughs> so let's have 10 minutes of Q&A and then I will summarize. Yeah, since your hand was yes. up first. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm Dr. Harpal Singh Malhotra. I'm senior advisor with British High Commission. Uh, just I will, uh, I have a you know comment to make and uh, I will leave it to uh, panel and house uh, open. Um, Gautam rightly said that there can be three perspectives. One is media, patient and hospital. And uh, I would like to add on that there will, should be a fourth. Hospital should be divided into hospital as such and it should be doctor's perspective, which Anisha mentioned, you know, it took it, she took it from here. So at least that, that thing is lacking, which is the situation is worrisome right now. The, as uh, Dr. Bagai mentioned twice, that doctors are the new generation, no one wants to be a doctor. So it's a tough task from, to move from here. The things are not uh, uh, so rosy. <coughs> Secondly, the, uh, the patient's perspective, I, I had a discussion with my mother's uncle. Uh, he's an Oxford alum, uh, chairman of Tata Modi, and uh, he had hearing problem. So he visited Gangaram and he, we were having drinks in the evening and he said, uh, see, uh, medical is facing crisis. So uh, I, I said, what happened? So he said, firstly, I am going to top doctor of Gangaram. I'm, I'm first, I've lost the trust seeing all the media reports and all that. Secondly, I don't have dirt of money. I can buy a uh, best sedan, but I, it hurts to pay from my pocket. So it's a, something uh, we have to have stakeholders everywhere. I have been in industry. There are pressure, there are targets, which are dying on stakes and pharma and even the, uh, Varun rightly said that, you know, if he has money and want to start a hospital, it will take eight years rather than hospital, a hotel taking only five years. So we have to, I think all the stakeholders has to, you know, work on this together. And What's your question? I appreciate the comment. What's your right. question? You so question, question is uh, where the, we have to, uh, you know, how we're bridging this gap between patient and the doctor, the, which are the two main pillars or, you know, uh, dots. So how do you bridge the gap between the patient and the clinician, essentially? Taburi, want to take a shot at it? Well, that's the million dollar question. Probably British High Commission will know the answer better. <laughs> <laughs> the NHS, they found some answers. Indian healthcare is still struggling. The one question, uh, I think, the, the, again, this is a very loaded question and there can't be just one answer. But well, there's one uh, simple statement that my cardiologist uh, once made in a hospital setting. He's a very renowned cardiologist of the country. And uh, in a particular meeting, he asked this question. He said, suppose you wanted to go to a good lawyer. Would you go to a good lawyer who drove around in a Mercedes? Answer was, a lot of people said yes. He is successful. An architect. Yes. But what if you were to see a doctor, Arvind Lal ex is an exception, in a Mercedes, usually you'll say he's a chore. 
So this perception which Rajit started off by saying is that the perception is that healthcare should be free. Doctors have lost faith partly because they charge. The earlier civil surgeon in 1947 did not charge because it was provided only by the government. There were no private practitioners. If they were, they were only family physicians. So I think once we start getting out of this mindset that everything costs, you think that the bed at All India Institute is free? No, all of us as taxpayers are paying for that. So the point is that if the trust is going to be decided on the basis of my being able to pay, then I'm sure there is going to be no answer to this problem. But otherwise, there are a lot that we need to introspect and do on our side. And one of the first things that I will start is by having better communication with the patients and amongst ourselves as doctors and nurses. That this is where we have failed. And like Anisha pointed out, maybe we need to hire Anisha <laughs> to find out what to do with the 60% perception part. Fair point. Thank you. Yeah. Varun, you, you go last. Shobha, at you, Brutus, you can't ask a question. <laughs> that lady. I'll come to you, Varun and Shobha. Yeah. Yeah, Thank you. Come, come um, so my question is, uh, first of all, congratulations on having such a good topic. It's so engaging. Um, the statistics I thought was a bit misleading because while the private uh, sector contributes to 75% of care and the government is 25, the reach of the private sector is not broad-based. And in a country like India where there is um, a need for basic necessities, healthcare is far away and the GDP figure kind of supports that. So my question is to Bhavdeep who said, uh, you know, I think it was a bit extreme when he said, leave it to the industry, we will decide and let the government come in because as a citizen of the country, I get worried uh, because the fundamental philosophy uh, of a, a for-profit organization is to give return to its investors. And uh, what's contradicting in the discussion is that we're having this discussion of ethics and industry and we're facing Mahatma Gandhi's uh, poster out there who says that, you know, industry should be seen as patriotic of the poor. Uh, so my question is, um, you know, is it practical at all uh, that uh, the industry takes a stand to say we know it best or should it be more of a participative um, uh, enactment by the government to step in? Because somebody has to step in, no doubt. The trust deficit that we're talking about even in the previous session, uh, in my view, is a bit urban centric. Because the poor man today in the village still <coughs> believes Dr. Bhagwan. I think we're sitting here and we're privileged to be sitting here and hence these discussions. So anybody, uh, uh, Mr. Mehta, open to you to take this question to anybody. You know, What do you see as a constructive way forward? I don't think the industry has all the answers. So let me, um, let me start. <clears throat> and uh, my, my first comment would be to clarify about um, your uh, comment about my what I said earlier. I think that any industry, regardless of uh, uh, whether it's healthcare or anything else, I think we have the opportunity and the responsibility to regulate and govern ourselves. And I think that's where we failed. Now the reality is that <clears throat> we represent one segment of healthcare, right? There are thousands and thousands of nursing homes in India today, for example. And there are forums where you have nursing home representation as well. Those conversations take place. I think the opportunity is, because what you end up with is you end up with either you have a regulated framework that's logical, consistent with good practices around the world, or you end up with something by default. Right? Our, one of our frustrations today, and, and as you heard me say earlier, uh, we're not victims here. We're, we've clearly had the opportunity. We've missed till now to take advantage of that is you end up having a framework established by someone who may or may not understand what's happening in the industry and understands the real challenges of what's happening. So that's why you have this, this push-pull. Uh, all right, sorry about that. <coughs> it was really brilliant what I said so far, by the way. <laughs> right? Um, what I started to say was that, um, that I think that um, <coughs> that we had an opportunity as an industry 
to establish some level of self-governance, some level of regulation, some level of guidelines that we operated under. We've, we've, blown, we've blown it. We've missed it, all of us, right, at some level or the other. I also, just said, without repeating myself too long, is that this, we only represent a small segmentation of the healthcare industry in India today. There are thousands and thousands of nursing homes. There's a regulatory framework that's required there as well. My concern as an operator, as a hospital operator today, or representing a hospital operator, is that the framework that we may end up with is one that may not actually be good for long term, the health of India, in terms of what we're looking at. So if you look at stent, for example, what's been happening with stent pricing, or if you look at, you know, there was a, uh, there's a conversation that's starting on now on, on C-sections, on normal delivery and C-sections being the same price. You start to figure out that what's the collateral impact of these things, and it's very easy to start to understand that long term it may not actually be good for India. So <clears throat> I agree that there needs to be a dialogue and a discussion, <clears throat> but we need to lead that discussion. Right? That's a failing on our part that we haven't done that yet. So I think that certainly there needs to be a dialogue, but I think what's happening today is because we haven't done anything, we're potentially getting a framework that's a default framework that very often has been used for other industries in the country as well. That's what happened to telecom. I mean, look at what happened to telecom from where we were, the Airtel dynasty, to what's happening today. Right? We live in the world of geo. So <clears throat> I think we have to be a bit careful. I don't, uh, I don't suppose or assume that we have all the answers, but I certainly think that with esteemed panelists like this and all of you here, the level and understanding around healthcare, the understanding of what's happening in healthcare globally, having seen models that work, models that don't work, I think we certainly have a head start in terms of what we could do. Dialogue required, but the lead should be taken by this group. Let me also add to the data that Dr. Puri was sharing. So if you look at primary care and birthing, obviously government has a major share. The moment you start looking at high and secondary, tertiary and quaternary, 80% of beds, 80% of OPDs, 80% of clinicians are with the private sector. And for complicated, you know, problems, people do travel. So that was the statistics that he was, you know, quoting. Yeah. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Can I just add to the lady's question, comments? You know, you said in villages they still say all that. It's true. So let's look at it from the government perspective. So in an ideal state, the government should be providing health care for all. It should be free. I am entitled to health care. They should take care of everything. But we are not in the ideal state. They are not able to do because of whatever constraints they have today. And so what is the option? Should we say that because government is not doing, private should also not do? So we need to have both together. And then once you decide that you need to have both together, then you have to see that if you need to put a private organization, somebody has to fund it. Now, whether it is a, a charity, a trust hospital, or whether it's for profit, somebody has to pay the salaries of the doctors, the nurses, the equipment. Somebody has to pay. In a aims, the government pays, which we don't see directly. Like Dr. Puri said, taxpayers pay, right? But in a private sector, somebody has to pay. So I think this notion that we should not you know, we sh everything should be from the government free and hospitals should not charge is wrong. So even if it is a trust hospital, like many of us are, you need to still ensure, if I may ask people here, why is a human body in India cheaper or less worth compared to somebody abroad? Not at all, in, as far as I'm concerned. So uh, we will provide the best healthcare possible and best treatment possible to the person concerned in India. Now, for that, somebody has to pay. Now, whether that insurance, maybe insurance is the answer. But not doing it is not the answer. You know, can I just add to that? I yeah, think that the traditional sources of funding that are available to many other industries are not available to this industry. Absolutely. And I think this industry needs to introspect on that. Okay, All other industries have access to funds in some form or the other. There are various reasons, you know, whether it is, if it is innovation in, 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 tech, in biotech and stuff like that, we, we don't know what kind of outcomes will be there at the end of 10 years when you create something, some R&D happens, whether the outcome of that will actually be effective in the market or not. And there are several other reasons. So how, and there is enough and more money available. And you're, you're absolutely right. This whole thing of if a consumer is willing to pay 500 rupees to go for the movie, 
and if all industries have unlocked a new surplus okay where consumer is willing to pay there is no reason why he should not pay for his health and for his life okay they are willing to pay for everything else today that same villager is willing to buy a mobile phone and pay talk time of 500 rupees every month today okay that that kind of need has been generated now there has to be funding available in the industry to be able to do all that how do we unlock new sources of funding whether it is if a government should be doing a swachh bharat cess or they should be doing a, a health cess before they do anything else or whether 0.5% of the csr budgets of all private companies should be going in there or there are bank loans and th those kind of bodies available or whether there are vcs and investors available unlocking funds for this industry is very very important otherwise you it will be a downward spiral of subsidies and reduced costs uh, reduced costs reduced costs and therefore you know finally the outcome will suffer the supply will suffer the quality will suffer absolutely nisha we do have a session tomorrow i think on innovation <coughs> in financing for okay. healthcare okay. gaurav well when well, no, kudos to you rajat you know for a very provocative conversation i think without repeating what all of you bring in you all have a very tough job from your various perspectives in the essence of time my direct question is there's a very fine line between uh, framework regulatory and uh, ethics there are two sides of the same coin because one can be you know implemented it's more transactional whereas what bhavdi he hit the nerve but that's more you know the cul culture of a place ethics is more about doing the right thing irrespective of the framework my question is given if incentivizing good behavior can it act as a catalyst both from an industry or from a government perspective because all these things basically you're just incentivizing like i said in any form from all your different perspectives so I, let me just um, i want to take a quick crack at that <clears throat> uh, absolutely the answer is incentivizing uh, the right behavior the right practices the right actions absolutely um, in addition in addition um, accountability for the wrong actions right and we are um, we are really <laughs> we are lousy at that right we're really poor at that we're not good at confronting situations we're not good at confronting people um, i am not a doctor i have the utmost respect for clinicians um, we are not good at having tough conversations with our doctors there you go we're really good at having tough conversations with our nurses because they they don't fight back they because don't the push back and they don't have necessarily the leverage so we are you know uh, <laughs> we're really um, we're strong and powerful when we deal with some people and not so much with others so i think that yes absolutely reward the right behavior but um, accountability when the right behavior doesn't take place whether it's management at the highest levels starting with people like us or whether it's clinicians nurses whoever it might be i think it has to be both prongs that's a strong message thank you thank you babdeep i'm uh, also very conscious of time i have to summarize as well shobha you had a question it's okay varun <laughs> uh i can't resist my question it's my favorite panel rajat so i'm going to take it uh this question is to you uh, to bhavdeep and to gautam uh the ideal scenario for india today or for indians today and trust will come back in a day if you provided the highest quality anisha's uh, god of the yester years as the doctor and you did not charge anything uh, trust me uh, the vote on trust will be 100% uh now i see a big challenge for all of you having seen the hospital side of it as well uh with falling prices um to the extent that patient is not willing to pay uh to the government regulating it to increasing costs and you all being required to maintain quality which is international standard now whether that's by virtue of self regulating as bhavdeep mentioned or by some of you wanting to graduate hospitals to a jci and so on and so forth Uh, how do you how do you manage this balance between uh, uh, cost and quality uh, a little sub part of the question is that i'm aware of the fact that what we use in india what we consume in india despite very favorable outcomes is not the best in the world uh, so we have a technology lag when it comes to equipment as well as consumables and devices um, so in this state uh, i know there is a significant challenge i'm posing this question to three of you uh, how do you manage So I'll take a shot and leave it to Gautam and Bhavdeep to answer as well. I don't think cost and quality are cross purposes. At least to me, quality is is a way of how you do things. It's more a culture, more an attitude, more an approach. Yes, when it comes to quality innovations or state of the art technology or you know innovations in in uh, point of care diagnostics etc., those do cost, right? 
So my view would be first we have to make sure you have a base level of quality which is offered to all patients. That is a non-negotiable at least in the healthcare world and that can be done at reasonable you know, uh, cost to the patients. Above that you have to choose a segment in which you play. So if somebody does want a suite and does want some other things, obviously that expen that you know cost has to be to be loaded. What is happening, I think, on the ground, as I said, there's a shade of providers, you know, from quacks to GPs in small colonies to small nursing homes to big large providers. What is complicating the issue is this dispersion in practices. And to Dr. Bhatia's point, if you had at least some norms to be able to lay down the protocols you know, of practice, you get to a base level of quality. I think that's what is the first step that we need to do. But I don't see cost and quality at cost purposes, actually. Well, I, I look, Varun, I think that there's a, um, because I agree with Rajat, obviously, um, but I think there's also an investment component. Right? So we started um, publishing clinical outcomes a year ago. We started doing it because we felt we needed to be able to differentiate between what we did in our system, just within our system, in fact, between one hospital and another. The ability to, you know, you talked about the fact, somebody mentioned the fact that we're ultimately, we, we have shareholders, right? We're responsible for driving a return. The assumption that you can one day monetize it is certainly in the back of our head, that at some point. So I think there's a bit of a lag component there. So I think you have to do exactly what Rajat said, but I think in parallel, you have to start thinking, how do you start getting mentioned in the same breath? Because we may never get mentioned in our lifetime. We may never get mentioned in the same breath as what's happening at Johns Hopkins. But there's no reason that we can't be mentioned in the same breath as the Singapore healthcare system or Bowman Grad. There's no reason that can't happen, not just in our lifetime, but in the next three to five to seven years. So I think there's a bit of an investment component. I think you have to keep doing exactly what Rajat said. But at the same time, I don't think that the cost structure, the cost environment gives us a pass uh, to say we can't do it because nahi ho sakta or pass it. You have to in parallel start, whether it's small steps, big steps, but you have to start because again, three to five years from now, we can't be having the same conversation. We have to have said that we move forward and we should be able to say that by virtue of what we did three years ago, five years, small investments, that by virtue of that, there's a financial model that actually supports it. So thank you, Bhavdi. Gautam, anything to add? Just one, uh, all of you have already said, just one thing is, uh, Varun knows this from the past, that when, when we, there is always a fine line between the uh, patient outcome, care versus the profit. And I think in the hospital space, even if the people, uh, hospitals are for profit, still the patient care is at the top. So some sometimes there are decisions which are made which are not acceptable commercially but are good for the patient are made. So that's why what Rajit said, so quality is kept uh, to that. Having said that, I think there is also an appropriate tech, uh, quality. We would ideally like to use everything, you know, what is available internationally, but then you have to be cognizant of the fact that in India what is appropriate. And then to manage, you f do other things on efficiency, productivity, and you know, so just manage the other aspects of the PNL to ensure and last, you know, lighter vein, you hire brilliant guys like these and they make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So in the interest of time, I really have to stop and summarize. Uh, as I said, it's a very emotive subject, many shades of grey, unfortunately. Much more than 50 shades of grey, actually. Uh, but you know, there's an interesting book called How Doctors Think, which Shabnam gifted me and I read through it at least twice now. As we are taught in management institutes how to make decisions based on algorithms and facts, exactly the way how clinicians work. Unfortunately, medicine is not a perfect science and art. So unless they look at the patient, spend time, order a few blood tests or x-rays or, or, or scans, they will not be able to make a good decision. So all clinicians are also taught during their education, if I'm right, how to use a set of parameters to come to a conclusion. And the downside of an algorithm is it always has 10% outliers. So I think you, we must, you know, as consumers, I'm a consumer of healthcare as well, must keep that in mind. 
uh, doctor will endeavor mostly to do what is best for the patient, but there's a 10% margin of error which occurs because medicine is not perfect. So I've heard the following six or seven suggestions from all the panelists on how to build an ethical you know, uh, organization. First, a lot of talk around transparency. That the nub of the issue really is what we communicate with the patients, what the nurse said, what the GDS said, what the clinician said, and what the patient or the caregiver understood. So how do you really make that very robust? As Babdeep said, Parda Hatao, uh, Dr. Puri said, we don't have you know, in our, in our schools, uh, medicine schools, any uh, courses on soft skills or finance. So how do you look at the entire, you know, transparency bucket, including managing perception and imagery? Second, I heard about patient partnership. After all, at the end of it, it should be a patient's decision. And if I remember my, my early readings, there's a concept of autonomy in ethical practice where ultimately the patient is in charge of his or her body. All we can do is suggest in a counsel but the patient has to. So how do you build that partnership and make the patient equally accountable you know, for, the, for, 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 uh, for the treatment? Uh, a lot of talk about collaborative framework. We discussed it in the morning as well. There has to be a way of collaborating between the government you know, and the private sector. Uh, it is everybody's responsibility. Not one player can fulfill the responsibility of accessible, affordable healthcare in India. It has to be a collaboration in whatever shape or form. We talked about you know comm structures, uh, this issue about adverse incentives, you know, and Bhavdeep mentioned saying fix it and align it to clinical outcomes. A lot of discussion around publishing clinical outcomes. Though there was a caveat by Dr. Puri saying as you publish, there is an unintended interpretation as well. You know, so be careful on that side. Uh, unanimous, you know, uh, opinions around self-regulator in terms of quality. You know, and therefore putting the framework ourselves and letting the government, you know, then come and uh, comment on it. And sixth, you know, Anisha talked about structural issues. One issue was not enough clinicians, and therefore the issue. And the second really is a large out-of-pocket expense. The moment there are insurance schemes, you know, most of the issues, you know, get dealt with. Here are six or seven themes I think we picked up. So to all the panelists, thank you very much, and to all the audience, thank you for listening and indulging. Thank you.